I'm probably getting ahead of myself. But NATO is even dragging neutral nations into its schemes like EU member states and Switzerland. The mobility program forces Austria, Sweden and Finland to provide their transport capabilities to NATO to move its armed forces. This, NATO-centric, approach is becoming omnipresent and the EU meekly agrees to be an obedient appendix of the alliance despite loathing its role and declaring that Europe needs strategic autonomy. Then Ukraine, under President Yanukovych, simply decided to take a short pause before signing the association agreement with the EU, because it contradicted the already existing free trade area agreement in the Commonwealth of Independent States. And when that happened, the maiden protests were orchestrated from Brussels. They did it, because Yanukovych realized that it was necessary to harmonize trade with Russia, the Commonwealth of Independent States in Europe. That was the only reason. The protests turned into a violent conflict in February, 2014. Yanukovych was willing to stop this, and he signed the agreement on the settlement of the political crisis in Ukraine, promising that he would organize an early election, which he would not have won. Poland, France and Germany were the guarantors of that agreement. After the opposition staged a coup and trampled over these agreements, the guarantors just stayed silent, didn't say anything. Or even welcomed these putschists taking power. President Zelensky came to power under the banner of peace, promising to save the lives of both Ukrainians and Russians. At the end of the day, however, he succumbed to the same anti-Russian sentiment as the Poroshenko government before him. He referred to the people of the Donbass as animals, just like Prime Minister Yatsenyuk under Poroshenko, who called them non-humans. We saw him stand idly by as a bloody war continued against his own people. He essentially lied to everyone when he promised to bring back order, when he signed countless deals with Donbass representatives and then violated those agreements without batting an eye. For eight years, we've been appealing to the collective conscience of the West while desperately trying to reason with Zelensky's government, which has developed all the hallmarks of an ultra-radical, neo-Nazi regime. And the West failed to stop it. Honestly, I don't even think the West was trying to stop it, because to the West, Ukraine has always been a tool to contain Russia, even before 2014. This entire situation has come about because the West refused to recognize that Russia has equal rights in constructing the European security architecture. This is also supported by the reaction of leading NATO countries, the United States in particular, to the initiatives put forward by President Putin last December. Back then, he talked about the need to act in good faith and honor one's agreements. More specifically, he was referring to the idea that any country, even when it chooses to join a military alliance, must never pursue any policy that would infringe on the security of any other country. That was a commitment approved and signed by the presidents and heads of government of all OSCE countries, and it is also enshrined in NATO-Russia Council documents. The West has flat out refused to comply with this principle. Then we heard President Zelensky say that if Russia continues pushing Ukraine to fulfill some of its obligations, he would consider the option of Ukraine restarting its nuclear weapons program, that was a step too far. They have the capabilities in terms of technology and equipment. President Putin spoke about this, and so did our experts. But I can assure you we won't let them. It's astonishing to hear what European and especially German politicians are saying now about their duty. Take Germany. My counterpart Ms. Baerbeck said, as quoted by various media outlets, that Germany simply had to supply Ukraine with weapons, considering its historical responsibility. What does that mean? Does Germany recognize it as its duty and historical responsibility to support neo-Nazis? That's a strange connection there. And Ursula von der Leyen said that today the EU and Ukraine are closer than ever. Meaning what? I guess it means that if you're a Russophobe, a fascist or a neo-Nazi, you're free to do anything you want. This is the reaction to Russia restoring justice in Ukraine, 
but has there been anything remotely like this when hundreds of thousands of Iraqis, Libyans and Syrians were dying at the hands of the US and their enlightened democratic allies who sent their troops to fight wars thousands of miles away from their own borders? So for the US, a small vial and a claim that it's a national security threat was enough to justify the Iraq invasion. The US and Iraq, the US and Libya or Syria, they're so far away, and yet the US feels it has the right to do these things. No international bodies condemned these instances of groundless military aggression as a violation of international law. But look at the hysteria that started now as if on cue when it came to security threats to Russia that exist right at our borders. We were ready for anything. I had no doubts that the EU and NATO would obediently follow the USA, especially when the future of Nord Stream 2 became clear. It is obvious that this project played a key part, and it will go down in history as something that showed us the place of Europe, Germany in the international arena. Europe is completely dependent. When in previous years the West imposed sanctions on Arab or Latin American countries, they kept saying, at least at the Security Council level, that these sanctions would not target regular people, that their goal was to hurt the government, so it would change its behavior under pressure from the international community. This time, nobody is saying anything of this sort. Contacts between people have been banned by the Western countries, despite their previous rhetoric when they said that there should be no obstacles to building relationships between civil societies. Turns out they don't care about the principles they dictated in the international arena. By the way, they also demonstrated this when they began to freeze the assets of the central bank and private businesses. This is robbery, they abandoned all the rules that they had been implementing in international life in the last 70 years. And now they just crossed out these rules and went back to the golden rush era gangster capitalism. We saw how angry and aggressive the West was promoting its ideas of stopping Russia's influence. But we have friends and allies, we have numerous partners in the international arena that, unlike Europe and some other countries, didn't lose their independence and ability to put their national interests first. They are also under colossal pressure. I know that the Americans are now running all over the world through their ambassadors, forcing countries in Africa, Latin America and Asia to do something against Russia. This should be beneath a great power like the USA. There is no dignity in such behavior. But we are used to it. You know we've seen this before, when partners used shady tactics and methods. We will manage. I am 100% sure. President Putin has said many times, both in January and early February, that Russia will not tolerate a model of European security that relies on NATO as the dominant force. Especially when it's right on our doorstep. We've repeatedly said that we want to find an alternative solution. A solution that would reliably address security concerns of Ukraine, the nations of Europe, and, naturally, Russia. And that's the direction we should take. President Zelensky said that he was interested in security guarantees for Ukraine. I see this as a positive development. Our negotiators are ready to discuss these guarantees at the second round of talks with Ukraine. What we propose is an arrangement that will ensure the legitimate rights of all peoples living in Ukraine. Naturally, that includes all ethnic minorities without exception. This ensures they will have equal rights. This new arrangement should of course be reflected in the legislation of Ukraine, which now has a law on the three, indigenous peoples, as if the Russians never existed in Ukraine. Things like these create a legislative framework for further anti-Russian policies. And it isn't only anti-Russian. This also concerns other ethnic and national minorities like Hungarians, Romanians, Poles, and Bulgarians. Somebody wanted to bog Russia down with this artificial conflict designed by the West. American political experts say it would allow the US to fully focus on countering China. This cynical and totally neocolonial approach is very characteristic of our Western partners. This may be true, after all, 
but we were adamant in our attempts to avoid more bloodshed in Ukraine and prevent the country from becoming a foothold for future attacks against the Russian Federation regardless of the plans of the West. Our decisions were based on the situation on the ground. And the situation was concerning, mainly because the West was doing everything in its power to escalate the situation, making it more dangerous to Russia. Biden was the one who said that the only alternative to a new sanctions package is a third world war. That's a strange way of thinking. He is a very experienced politician, regardless of what the US is now doing on the international stage. Last June in Geneva, he and President Putin once again affirmed what the US and the Soviet Union leaders stated back in the 1980s. In a nuclear war, everybody loses, so it must never happen. In January 2022, all five leaders of the permanent member states of the UN Security Council signed a collective statement expressing the same idea. So, if you ask a person if there was an alternative to sanctions, and his only alternative is war, he must realize that World War III could only be fought with nuclear weapons. But our Western partners couldn't let go of their old habits if they believed this could happen in spite of all five permanent UN Security Council members have declared they are against it. 